welcome to the DTC Insider Podcast, where online business owners come to find actionable tips and tactics to grow their businesses. Now, here's your host, Brian Roizental. Hey, welcome to another episode of the DTC Insider Podcast. I'm Brian Roizental, your host, and today I'm going to interview Chad Rubin. He leads Profacy Operations and oversees its strategy. He often speaks about e-commerce, Amazon, and leveraging AI strategies on webinars and conferences worldwide. He's also the author of the Amazon bestseller, Cheaper, Easier, Direct, Prior to Profacy, he founded Think Crucial and co-founded Scubana and The Prosper Show. He's also a father, husband, and loves coffee and tacos. And I would love to know more about that, of course. Before talking to him, let me tell you that this episode is brought to you by BSR Digital. By now, I think we all know that customer acquisition costs are going up. There's lack of tracking and attribution is probably driving you nuts. And of course, we are going to discuss about this uh, with Chad. Audience sizes are getting smaller after the iOS 14 update, and if that wasn't enough, uh, there are other factors such as the recession and supply chain issues making it harder than ever to grow your e-commerce brand. That's why now more than ever, we need to understand that it's really important to level up the marketing and design a solid strategy as what used to work doesn't anymore. Here at BSR Digital, we have been helping countless e-commerce brands that wanted to scale their business to the next level through paid ads and email marketing for over a decade. To learn more, you can visit us at BSR bsrdigital.com and you can also email us at hello at bsrdigital.com now as promised i have chad here with me hey man thanks for being on the show hey what's up thanks for having me excited to be here yeah it's my pleasure man so why don't you start by telling the audience more about you and your story yeah so sh- short story I've been in e-com now for 15 years uh, i have an e-commerce business called think crucial we make vacuum filters coffee filters air filters cannabis filters anything that's replaceable for the home uh, out of that we had a lot of problems running that business and so we sort of use that as an incubator so we started uh, scubana uh, which is this company i sold in 21 of april uh, the prosper show which is an amazon conference i founded with three other people uh, and then i started prophecy out of that same pain. So I've been in the e-com game for 15 years. I've got my my bot- battle stars to prove it and excited to share with your audience uh, some takeaways and learnings that they can integrate back into their company. Yeah, I mean, 15 years. That's a lot, man. <laughs> a lot has changed, right? In the commerce I space. Mean, I mean, so much has changed. Uh, yeah, I use. I mean, it used to be software margins in my e-com company and that's that's changed dramatically. Yeah. And you said you you are a father. How many do you have? I have a son. He's three and a half. Oh, wow. I feel you. I mean, I have uh, three-year-old twins, a boy and a girl. So three is a tough one. You got your, yeah, you got your hands full. Two at one time. That's, that's intense. Yeah. Now, now it's okay. Let's say, but when they were born, probably was a different story. But anyway, I love coffee too. You know what? People say it's not good, but I drink a cup of coffee before going to bed, and I cannot, I cannot stop doing it. I mean, it's stronger than me, you know. Wow, I'm surprised you're able to drink coffee before bed. And what's your preferred brewing method? Uh, I have I have an espresso machine. Okay. Um, but I I love all kind of coffee and methods. I'm okay and tacos. I love Mexican okay. food. So <laughs> we are lying there. So um, I'd love to, to uh, if, if you could walk me and the audience more, uh, you know, uh, through your story. You know, I, I know that you own uh, and sold many companies. Are those related or are is probably, did each company you create solve the need of, that you saw in the previous venture or are those like, independent business businesses yeah so um so i used to just going back in my career i used to be on wall street and i covered uh internet stocks so i would, I would advise institutional investors hedge funds to buy sell or short stocks and so i covered amazon specifically my parents had a vacuum store a brick and mortar store so i was like hey mom and dad this is back in 2006 2007 
you guys need to start selling on Amazon, the marketplace. And they were like, what? Selling on Amazon? Like, what, what does that mean? So I started helping them. So I got, I got fired from my job February uh, 2009 and started helping them. And then I went, I was like, okay, like people are competing for the buy box on Amazon. We were also on Magento at the time. Now we're on Shopify. Uh, let's build our own private label business. So we started manufacturing our own products because I saw the writing on the wall. Um, Warby Parker had maybe just come out or Bonobos, right? These are early D 2 C digitally native brands that had just come out. And so <clears throat> we went direct consumer. So like each thing that we started would solve a problem. So first was solving the need for direct consumer. Then was solving the need for multi-channel, which was Cubana, right? Uh, order management, inventory management, and analytics across many different channels you sell in, no matter where you sell, no matter where uh, the customer is on their journey with your product. Then the Prosper Show, there was no community for Amazon sellers, another problem that needed to be solved. And then with Prophecy, it was around price, right? The fact that most brands, in fact, all brands, majority, let's just say majority, don't change pricing, it's static. And so asking why and figuring out how, well, if price is the quickest lever to maximize profit, why is nobody pulling it, right? What is, what's going on there? So exploring that deeply. And then recently I launched a, a, a SaaS mastermind called Deep and Sassy. And that was because I, I feel alone as a, as a founder on this journey and I wanna learn from other people's mistakes that they've made. So I can actually, uh, it's a shortcut, right? Learning from other people and accelerating progress is very important to me. Awesome, yeah. Uh, I used to belong to an agency mastermind. And uh, as you said, being a founder, uh, unless you have a partner, but even if you do have a partner, feels like you know lo a lonely ride and you need to you know talk to somebody about what you are struggling with uh besides your you know your partner or your friends someone who has been through the same challenges or similar challenges than you and understand you from a different perspective right so i think the community uh aspect is really important for for a founder so that's awesome um you mentioned scubana uh I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that that company was acquired, right? Yeah, it was acquired in April of 21. And uh, so I ran that company, I think we started in 2015. Okay, so uh, we have here um, a lot of founders listening that are considering or have considered, you know, being acquired. Uh, so could you please mention, you know, uh, a few tips for them. I mean, how to think about it, the key uh, things that they need to have dialed in before getting acquired or how to cut uh, a good deal for them. Oof. Uh, let's see no where pressure. to begin. There's <laughs> <laughs> so look, Stubano is a really difficult business. It was very challenging. Uh, there was a lot of high highs and a lot of low lows. And in fact, in 2019, we made a layoff. Uh, that was pretty significant. It was a 20, roughly 20 to over 20% layoff, right? And I thought all things were going to end, right? That was like the lowest of lows. And then suddenly, and so we we course corrected. We made some mistakes in the business. We course corrected. We planned. We developed a rhythm and a cadence of how we were going to essentially lockstep expenses and revenue in a more meaningful way. And suddenly in 20, 20 COVID happens, March of 2020, and essentially there was a shift of spending to online from brick and mortar. So why am I sharing this? This is very important because I got super lucky, and uh, a lot of times you, I think you create luck, and you sometimes have to wait it out a little bit longer for you to see that there's light at the end of the tunnel. So that's like to me, it's like a big part of our story was like you know we we slugged it out. We worked through these challenges. We started to create our own luck. So things were going really well at the company. And of course, we built an ERP system operation platform that was really the epicenter focused on D2C brands selling e -com. There was a pandemic. People stopped shopping in the brick and mortar stores and moved to clicks. And we were able to capture our market, a large part of that market share. So with that, when things are going well, I kind of wore this visionary hat of the company. And I was like, okay. How can I sell bananas in bunches? How can I, instead of subtracting from the company, do addition? And she's like, 2019, we had a big subtraction from the company. 
Uh, and so in 2020, I reached out to them and I was like, hey, like, I have this idea, your customer's customer is our customer. Imagine a world where you can, we can partner together and give you a spiff and, and they're like, well, why don't we just buy you? So I think that was, there was never, we were probably never on their radar and suddenly now we're having a conversation and they ultimately bought us in April 21, which is pretty amazing to think about, right? Where we created that from that one conversation, we created a massive opportunity that unlocked wealth for my family and for our employees' families and for my business partners' families that we would have never experienced otherwise. Awesome. I mean, it all starts with one conversation, I guess. It's a matter of knowing uh, what doors to knock on and who to talk to, right? So um, I'm happy that that worked out for you guys. So I, I, I imagine that you learned a lot of lessons uh, from, you know, from that business. Uh, I mean, probably during the time you were at the business or maybe after the, the, after you sold the business. So do you have any, any lessons you learned or any mistakes that you see SaaS companies make nowadays? Woo, so many. Uh, firstly, like in my new company, I've, I've made a framework of all the things I didn't want from that company, right? The things I didn't want to take were the things I wanted the mistakes, which are really learning lessons or opportunities. So a few things with that business. One, we were a cost saving software, right? So we help people become more efficient, but showing people ROI or being in the revenue stream, it was not something that we were a part of. So I wanted to be in my next thing. I want to be in the revenue stream, right? I want to help people make more money. So that that was a big one. Um, two is I wanted to found a company on my own. Right? I wanted to actually be a single founder, which by the way, as you learn from all these mistakes you've made and you think you're not going to make those mistakes, you're making all these other new mistakes, right? Like you're never not making mistakes. So uh, I think that <laughs> that's a learning in itself. We, I established in this reset from April of 21 till I resigned from Stubana in October of 21, um, I came up with, oh, there's my cat. I came up with core values and like uh, my mission and infused my core values into my company, into my new company, which are now on the About Us page of Prophecy. So I'm like taking all these things I'm leading and I'm building from a different place. I'm building from like a much more centered, grounded, heart-centered place. Whereas I think building Stubana, I had a lot of family members invested and friends, and that drove me from a place of fear. And I was always nervous that like there was going to be another shoe that was going to drop and I would lose their money. So those are some examples. I can go into more details, but those are those are a good start. I think you know today I posted on LinkedIn a post around startups and hiring, and hiring instead of like going out and hiring execs for VP level positions, hiring people for their potential. And especially a startup that's actually tight on money to hire based on the slope of the individual, the pace of their learning. And so one of the things I identified early on in my previous company is I hired a few core people that were with us from the beginning of that company to the end. And we hired uh, people that were high potential entry level employees. And that's something that I've done at Propsy now, right? We're on a budget, we've raised capital, but we did a pre-seed round with the prove out our model. And so we're working, we're hiring people that are entry level, but have massive potential that can make a huge impact on the company. Right. You mentioned core values and there are many people in the audience that I'm sure they know what they are about, but some people that they don't, um, and some people that do know what they are about, they don't believe they will actually help you in the practical world, let's say, but only the theory or to write in the document. Why do you think that core values are a must, if you believe that, for any business nowadays? Yeah, so I think a few things. One is it establishes a rule set. And if an organization mirrors 
an organization is a aggregation of human beings. And so if I'm the creator of this organization, it's going to mirror uh, my desires, my wants, my needs, and also my flaws. And so there's certain things I don't want to trade off when building a company that maybe I traded off in the past. And so establishing a clear set of core values, not just core values that sit on a website and just are bullshit, right? Like I'm talking about like real core values that deeply resonate with me that could be operating principles of my life that are now infused into the company. So these are operating principles that you can actually hire against and fire against as well. So it's it's a framework to really build a company and make sure like it's make sure I'm leading from a place of of positivity and well intention, but also like of what I really want when I started the company, because you can lose sight of that early on and 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 easily. So as an experienced founder, um, you mentioned before uh, that um, you used to measure uh, a few metrics in your business, but some others you, you didn't, or you. Um, I I see the same thing. Like, um, let me let me rephrase. I I see that many e-commerce brands nowadays, and I'm talking about e-commerce, but it's all brands, I would say. But in this case, particularly e-commerce brands are not measuring the the metrics that matter. So which ones do you see them measuring and which ones do you think they should measure and why? Yeah. So I think people get caught up in vanity metrics, right? Revenue number of employees that you have and uh you know how many times have you been to a party where people ask you the number of employees and it's like the number of employees isn't necessarily a true indicator of success it's actually if you can maximize revenue while minimizing employees right essentially you become more efficient with your employees which matters the most so we just came off of a decade or more of massive e-commerce growth of growing at all costs. And I believe we've entered a new era, which is growth uh, at the lowest cost, but sustainable, profitable growth. And so all these D2C brands, Amazon aggregators raise all this money, right? And there's been a structural shift in the market. Interest rates are high. A lot of these models don't necessarily make sense anymore. And so... When you're looking out into, at least for my e-com company, you know, I can speak to myself, we went ahead and started replacing these vanity metrics with metrics that like matter. Like what is the metric that matters, right? For me, and I think for business in general, which is economic value, which is measured, measured in profit. And so I think contribution profit is the gosp is, is like the metric for e-commerce. And so while you have like a lot of Amazon sellers that are managing to an ACOS as on a, on a campaign and telling their agency, oh, just manage the 20% or manage the 18% or manage the 30%, it's an efficiency metric, but it's not telling the whole story. The inverse of ACOS uh, is return on ad spend, which is just the money that you put in relative to the revenue that you get out. And so I believe that we should be shifting our focus into profit on ad spend. So replacing revenue metrics with profit. Replacing revenue, perhaps, with pro, uh, revenue, revenue, right? Instead of just talking about revenue, talk about revenue per employee or talk about profit per employee. So like ratios that actually matter so you can understand the efficiencies in your company. You have like... Uh... Uh, of course, it depends on the on the industry and on the business. But do you do you have any ballpark figure for the for a healthy profit margin for a DTC brand or an e-commerce business? I think net operating margins should be above fifteen or twenty percent. It depends on the category. Like I, I'll share with you that. So I've been working on all these other businesses, and I'm not a great parallel entrepreneur. So 
I have my e-com company. It was in the wrong hands. Uh, I hadn't spent enough time on it or deployed enough love into it for it to to really maximize its potential. And so I ended up taking it over in October of 22. This company for the past 18 months has been losing thousands of dollars a month, net margins that were negative. And we've been turning it around, right? We started off at like negative 10% margins. And then we went to, we got to break even. And now we're at about a 10% margin and we're moving on up to about, I want to get to about 18 to 20% operating margins. So uh, it's possible. It took a lot of hard work and a lot of effort and a lot of alignment uh, and clarity from the team. So they knew the metrics that mattered and knew how to get their job done so they can perform. What do you think that contributed or helped to turn it around? A couple things. One is pricing. So we essentially started dog fooding our own product at Prophecy to dynamically change price and maximize profit. There was a ton of value leakage that was happening. Two, we redid our listings on Amazon. So like on a Shopify site, it'd be your product detail page, uh, but we did 3D renderings. We did a lot more benefits. We, we did a lot of Wi-Fi asking why about every statement to get to the core of like what we're delivering to the customer. Uh, and then three, in terms of alignment and clarity, we, because I'm running a different company right now, Prophecy, that's my focus. I needed to come in and take over the e-com company unexpectedly. And so with that, I implemented EOS, which is a level 10 meeting. And we started having level 10 meetings that really created alignment in the org. And like we had a scorecard measuring performance and weekly reporting. And that just efficiently made my life so much easier. Awesome. Uh, for those who don't know what EOS is, is the entrepreneurial operative system, right? Uh, I don't know if there are many, but I read one book, Traction, Traction right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it talks about core values as well. So we'll leave the link in the show notes as always. So um, that's great because there are many companies right now. I mean, we, we, we've discussed this uh, in many episodes, but in a nutshell, we have seen like, uh, you know, many e-commerce brands have had EDC during COVID. Many didn't, right? Uh, but many did have EDC because there was a spike in demand and they were doing great. But now they don't know how to do many other things or they need to look at, the, uh, at some other aspects of the business that they didn't need to before because they didn't know, they didn't care, or they didn't have the time or whatever. Right. So right now, many companies are focusing in, in on retention, whereas before many companies, I mean, I'm not talking about the big ones sometimes. Yes, but most times it's like the small to mid-sized companies. They didn't know what to do in terms of the retention, customer loyalty, customer success. And now if they don't, I don't know what you, what your thoughts on this are, but many brands, if they don't have anything to offer on the back end, mm. it'll be hard to make a profit, right? Yeah, I think when, when times are good, uh, it sort of obfuscates like the metrics that you really, that are most important to be measuring. And so when times are bad, like now we're think there is economic softening, right? Ecom has corrected back to the, the pace it was before COVID. And so it's forcing sellers to really look at metrics that matter, right? And sustainable profitability is one of them. Right. And you mentioned pricing and these other company that's your focus right now. Could you please tell me a little bit more about the company, what it does, and why pricing is so important for businesses right now? Um, so first of all, uh, pricing is the single largest lever that you can pull in your business to maximize profit. And I think nobody knows actually what the optimal price is because they don't have the sophistication, they don't have the technology uh, to constantly analyze it and to understand it. So I started thinking about and analyzing our pricing in my econ company. Now I have 500 and something SKUs with kits and bundles that gets you to a thousand SKUs. And uh, I was staring at a 
strange is I'm turning around this company and I'm like, you know, I just had my other company acquired and I'm thinking about how do I turn this thing around? And suddenly it dawned on me like pricing, we're leaving a lot of money on the table. We never change price. We're changing ad spend all the time, but we're not changing price. So I started researching around price and there's a lot of misinformation around pricing because people, gurus right on Amazon or would say, hey, just raise price. Oh, inflation is here. Increase your price 5%. So if you just increase price, you can really kill your growth, especially on Amazon, because if you're increasing price blindly, it affects your competitive positioning. So then the question is, well, like, how do you align price? And is pricing one size fits all or maybe pricing should change based on a, a lot of other data? On Amazon specifically, there's something called a knock-on effect, right? Your price today affects your orders tomorrow. It's also known as the flywheel, right? So if you lower price, maybe you increase demand, which spurs velocity, unit velocity, which means that you get a higher rank on Amazon, which means you're not on borrowed land anymore, which means you own that land. So there's a lot that goes into pricing. And so then I started actually testing pricing. So for those that are on Amazon or off Amazon, we started this like spreadsheet where I started managing like, like signals that mattered, right? So I was like, okay, here's the date. Here's the current price. This is our net margin. This is after all the fees from advertising, et cetera, all baked into the spreadsheet. And this is the, this is the margin I want to achieve. And like what happens with these small adjustments in price? So we started house, to house this material in a source document. And then we started tracking competitors because on Amazon, you need to track your competitors and how they react to your price change because your price on Amazon, like the price that you, the change that you make doesn't happen in a bubble, right? It happens based on what, how Amazon reacts to your price change and how your competitors react to your price change. And then we essentially started connecting pricing to advertising and thinking and, and, and connecting that discipline across function of marketing, advertising, my my controller at the company that's doing the finance. So putting it all together in our L10 meetings, even managed to managing to net margins based on price changes. So that's really how it all started. And then having like a cadence where we're all communicating very clearly around those price changes, keeping everyone aligned and keeping pricing at the center of our conversation. I think that's very important as well. Um, so if you, I mean, for anyone listening, at least my advice, and I would love to hear your thoughts about it, about what you were saying, and I was saying before as well, is that if you if you have one product, or let's say if you have not one product, but if you can if you can add products on the back end, if you could do upsells, cross sells, or anything else, please do. Uh, besides increasing the price on your products, which is uh, if if the industry allows you, of course, if your competitors allows to, that would be, uh, of course, uh, a great way to stop leaving money on the table, but also to uh, keep adding value to your customers and, and, and making them come back for more. That's something that many brands are not doing and are leaving a lot of money on the table as well. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think the lifetime value and not just being around for the one-time purchase is, is very important. Not all categories are like that, uh, but yes. Yeah, 100%. Um, and um, I know you, uh, we have uh, only a, a few minutes left, but I wanted to ask you about AI because I know you, uh, you know about uh, AI, and uh, I think you implement that in, in, in some of your companies, right? So what do you think about this whole chat, chat GPT hype? So on chat GPT, I'm a huge fan. Just so you know, Prophecy is an AI first company. So we started building our proprietary algorithm a year before chat GPT became mainstream and the world found out about AI. So while everyone was focusing on NFTs and Web3, I was building a model uh, over a year and a half ago around pricing. And that's how we actually made our price changes. So we pull in all these signals, we uncover uh, all these signals on Amazon to maximize your profit and train our model. Now, the beautiful thing about AI is that it, it gets better over time. It observes, it learns, it experiments, and it self-improves. And that's something that a human just can't do. 
uh, which is why I've been very, very bullish on the technology in itself. In terms of ChatGPT, I'm, I, I've incorporated that into my entire business. I use it, I have it open on like a screen all day to make either emails better, to have a better tone, change tone. tone. Uh, I use it for all my prod detail pages. I use it for my investor deck that I just use for prophecy. And it comes down to actually using the right engineering and crafting the right prompts so that whatever you're putting into the software, you're going to maximize the output out of the software. Exactly. I even have an email Chrome extension called LEAI, which is ChatGPT built into my Gmail that essentially will look at my email and respond. And it is like, it'll get me at least 70 to 75% there on my responses. What's the extension name again? Yeah, it's called LEAI. E L L. Let me see. It's uh, let me see if I can type it in here. L E yeah L E A I dot com. Okay, so we will add that to the show notes as well as all the information that you mentioned. But last but last but not least, what we will add, if you have any books to recommend, is that we always ask the guests to um, you know mention any books, so we can recommend the audience something different to read. So do you have any? Uh, so, so I read a lot. Uh, I can share some that have been like, I think have had a pretty big impact on my life. So Atomic Habits, that was, yeah. that's an oldie but a goodie around building systems versus goals. I just read The CEO Within and that was full of a, a lot of tactics and like a blueprint for hiring, for firing, he pretty much shares everything in the book. Uh, right now I'm reading a book on like a holistic therapy called How to Do the Work, uh, which is super interesting. But before that, I was reading Art of Gathering, which is around gathering in a way that serves you and connects you with other people. And so a lot of times I would be feeling very disappointed or uninspired with a dinner I would go to. And uh, it just felt very stale. And so this is a way of how to activate potential through these experiences of gathering where you're an active facilitator in the process. So just a couple of good ones, so many yeah. more, but like I, I certainly like love learning and reading. I have, I have an unquenchable thirst for knowledge and wisdom. That's awesome. So for you guys listening or watching, uh, this will be in the show notes. So if you are at uh, the uh, DTCinsider.com, uh, uh, find the episode and uh, you will find the notes at the at the end. In case you're listening on Apple Podcast, make sure to go to that URL and you will find everything there. Uh, Chad, you've been great. I appreciate your time and I, I appreciate you sharing all of your knowledge. Um, so, um, where should people go to learn more about you and your companies? Yeah. Thank you for being such a gracious host. Uh, you can learn more about prophecy at P R O F A S E E.com prophecy.com. You can reach out to my email personally. It's Chad at prophecy.com. I'm posting thoughts around on LinkedIn and Twitter. So you can just find me Chad Rubin on those sites. Yeah, feel free to reach out. I'm here to support and, and make an impact on the community. That's awesome. Thank you again. I really uh, enjoyed the conversation. This episode was brought to you by BSR Digital. We help DTC brands grow through paid ads and email marketing campaigns. If you'd like us to help your business grow, head on over to bsrdigital.com and schedule a call with us.